Over 85% of global GDP is contributed to by family businesses. So most of the big corporates you are seeing are actually family-owned businesses. Hello, Right Learn and Earn family. So today I'm going to be interviewing Tsitsi Mutendi and she is a family business expert and she is also the host of the fabulous Enterprising Families podcast. So the reason I've asked her to come in today is because as you know I'm all about legacy and this particular guest is an expert in building healthier and stronger family businesses. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Kim. It's a great pleasure to have you on the show. And so I'd love for you to tell our audience a little bit more about your background and what made you get into this line of business. Well, I am a third generation family business owner. And every time I say that, everybody's like, ooh, she comes from money. But the truth is, entrepreneurship is what really ran in our family. My grandparents on both sides of my family were family business owners, albeit during a very difficult time in uh, African history. And then my parents were also family business owners. And I myself became a a family business owner when I started my entrepreneurship journey when I was about 19. So I think I worked for corporate for only three years. By the time I was 21, I was like, uh, corporate is not for me. And I focused just on being an entrepreneur. So I know and understand what it looks like to pass on generational businesses. I saw my grandparents failing at it. I saw my parents failing at it. And in 2018, when my dad passed on, I became the executor of his estate and I had to wrap up his estate as well as honor his legacy and his memory. At the same time, protecting the interests of all the dependents that were still alive, as well as all um, the individuals who had an interest in his estate. And so taking up that role was a very important space for me. And it made me realize that I also was a family business owner. It made me look back into my history and realize I'm a third generation family business owner. And it made me ask myself, why didn't the wealth spread across? Why didn't I get to inherit anything? Not that inheriting was important to me, but it, it became a case of when we build our businesses, we obviously are doing it with the our families in mind. We want them to benefit from the financial rewards of the solutions or the products that we're selling. And when they don't uh, benefit from it years down the line, to a certain extent, we have succeeded in showing them that it's doable, but we haven't achieved the goal, which is financial independence for our families. So for me, that became a very important call to action. And I started trying to figure out how could I protect my family businesses? So I have family businesses. I have a publishing firm that's 15 years old, a group of Montessori primary schools, as well as a tech development firm. So I have a very diversified portfolio. I love doing what I do, but adding this became something of a legacy project for me because I wanted to make sure that not only my family business succeeded, but other people who are building their families and building their businesses, that they realize generational wealth and they're able to secure that financial security for their family going forward. So obviously we're working with authors. And as an author, I'm wanting to pass on a legacy for my family. But I've noticed an interesting thing. So centuries ago, when it came to business, everything was about family businesses. If you were a carpenter, your kids were a carpenter. If you were a baker, your family were also bakers. And they kept everything in the business that way, in the family. But now I'm noticing that we have a little bit of a disconnect from that. We're not doing that anymore because as we are able to move into different countries, now we have different kinds of skill set. And so family business doesn't seem like an intuitive way to go through. Um, what are your thoughts on that? What, what do you think has caused that shift? Well, so I think what I'm about to tell you is going to blow your mind then. Um, when we look at family business from the family business um, industry or family business um, space, 
over 85% of global GDP is contributed to by family businesses. So most of the big corporates you are seeing that you look at and say these are corporates are actually family owned businesses. They're just structured in ways that are very creative to protect, um, obviously, the inheritors to protect uh, shareholders if they're family businesses that are floated on stack, stock exchanges and to also to make sure that they align with corporate governance as well as family governance. A lot of the businesses globally are family owned businesses. Um, family owned businesses are the biggest employers after government when it comes to employing people. Um, 20, for it to be defined as a family owned business, over 25% um, shareholding or ownership of a company has to be within a family. So that means it could be owned by a group of people within the family, one family member. Um, they could just have majority shares in a in a in a big corporate, which makes them a decision maker that is quite influential to the direction of the company. So a lot of family businesses are not so much held within the skill set. So in the past, you'd find if they're carpenters, they continue being carpenters. Now you're seeing with the advancement of technology, that has slightly changed. If they were carpenters, they start setting up maybe hardware stores. They might start setting up diversifying their portfolios and having different uh, businesses within um, the same niche, but doing different things. Also, family members, as a family grows, become diverse in their thoughts, in their talents, in their wants to do's. And um, so when you're working with uh, a, an entity like a family office, you might find that they have got a huge investment portfolio that has lots of different businesses that are owned by the family that speak to the different needs of the family members or the different interests of the family members. And especially with now with the tech generation, you find that somebody might decide um, they want to continue taking their investment from the family businesses into tech industry, and they do very well in that industry, and they then never have to look at carpenting, but their origins might be from carpenting. So family businesses grow. They start from just usually uh, mom and pop stores, and then they go into second generation, which is the kids themselves, which is the sibling partnership. And then they go into third generation, which is what we call the cousin confederation. And by then you're probably looking at 15 different families that are all looking at the same family business for sustenance and for, for growth and support. So what we really need to look at when we're looking at family businesses is, is the family business sustainable enough to be able to support the growing family. And I always give an example of um, a pot. So we all have these pots in our kitchens. And when we're a small family, we probably use one or two pots or one, let's just use one pot and we can cook and pour out and cook and pour out. And we can feed a, an average family of three people, mom, dad, and, 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 and a small child. But as the family grows now, you have more children, you need to get a bigger pot or you need to rethink of getting more pots. And by the time you go from sibling partnership where you have the mom and dad, plus let's say, for example, I have three children, three other families that mom, dad, with children, that pot just won't cut it anymore. The family business just won't cut it anymore. And then they their children have children now we're a cousin confederation so if we say an average of five children for the three families that's 15 families and 15 families still eating out of that small pot is highly unlikely so because of that that pot needs to grow and as family businesses we need to think outside the thought of this pot is going to be enough because it's enough for us now as we're looking for it we need to think into the future and prepare for those in the future all right, so you've already blown my mind with the 85% statistic. That is just amazing. What I'm finding in the author community is that sometimes there's an author and then they have a spouse that is really not happy in their current work environment. And so a lot of authors who get it right are actually able to retire their spouse out of the job and then the spouse helps them inside the business. However, that brings a different kind of dynamic because when you're working outside, um, you have challenges, you come home, you discuss it with your spouse, and then you can say, oh, this colleague of mine really annoyed me today. However, it could be when you're working together that the colleague that's annoying you is actually your spouse, and then you have to sit down and have a meal with them. So that brings a, a lot of tension. And how do you 
work with people that are working in that kind of dynamic, separating work and family night when you are actually working together. Can you give us your insights for that? Right. So it's very important to understand conflict in itself. People, when they hear the word conflict, will think of conflict. They think of war zones. They think of uh, disorder, disarray. They think of uh, negative emotions that come with conflict. And they all of a sudden clench up. All your body muscles just become tight inside you. And you, you just find it difficult to navigate because it seems like you've got this big negative entity that has just entered the relationship chat group and you don't know how to deal with it. But the truth is, when it comes to conflict, there's different types of conflict. And they are lower level conflict, mid level conflict, and high level conflict. And what we need to realize is that when we're looking at a, at a conflict, is to identify what type of conflict this really is. Is it a process conflict? Is it a systems conflict? Is it a personal conflict? Because if it's a process conflict, it might be uh, arise from there's a process that needs to happen for a certain thing at work or a certain thing within the family in the home that we've committed to, and that hasn't happened. And so one of us feels disgruntled because it hasn't happened. And therefore, we're not communicating that we're feeling this way. And the conflict arises. And until somebody brings up the conversation of what has caused this conflict, no one is talking to each other. Everybody is angry. And until we can communicate, that conflict cannot be resolved. Same way with the systems process. Is it the business system that's causing conflict within the relationship? Or is it the family system that's causing conflict within the relationship? And can we separate these two conflicts in a way that is healthy? Because if we think it's a business system that's causing the conflict, that means we need to sit down and have a business meeting and have a conversation around what is happening within the business that's causing this conflict? And what are the results that can happen if this conflict continues? In the same way, if it's the family system, it means you have to take away um, your hat of work and being serious and systems and procedures and say, is this a relationship issue? Is it a, a communication issue? Is this something that we um, can work through and how best can we work through? Can we resolve it together? Do we need to get someone involved like a professional therapist or someone to help us wade through this? Um, is it being caused by a third party or is it something that's between the two of us? And so all these things is you're trying to identify what is the cause of the conflict. And then the third conflict is when there's all out war and nobody wants to communicate nobody wants to engage the other person so you're not quite sure whether it's a systems whether it's a relationship whether it's just all out war and in those cases taking a step back giving everyone room to breathe and then trying to engage each other. If you cannot engage each other, that's when you need to bring an intermediary. You need to bring somebody in who's respected by all parties, who um, can all parties can confide in and feel comfortable and safe, who can then work as intermediary to try to unpack what's really caused this conflict. Because they sometimes we tend to, when we're working separately and going to work in the morning, we sweep things under the carpet. We try to forget and say, okay, it's okay. I don't have to deal with this today. Oh, you know what? Uh, they just made me mad. They didn't take out the, 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 the trash. They didn't take out the garbage. So, you know what? I'll just do it. But it may cause some resentment that's building up. And then when the other party now joins your business and there's some things that are left undone, that habit of saying, oh, it doesn't matter. I'll do it starts causing resentment, start causing issues. And that can escalate from just a low level. We can talk about it. I really feel like you're helpful if you take the garbage out, like you said you would, to you don't understand me. You don't communicate with me. I do everything by myself. You're not helpful. And now you have two partners working on the same business, but you have a conflict that has built up over time. So my husband and I have worked together for many years and I can honestly say that there are times when there's been conflict where the tension gets so much that you almost feel, oh, I actually just don't feel like doing this work anymore. 
But you have to get into the mindset of saying the customer comes first. And if you can't put the customer first, then at the end of the day, what are you actually doing in this business? So I think what's really important especially when you're building your legacy and it is legacy building because it's building for something or a space that you you are no longer going to inhabit physically and a place where your memory will be immortalized in a way and it takes all your life works and put it in a, in a space where they're scrutinized and your next gen or the people your inheritors are the ones that have to be responsible and starting the conversation around um, legacy building around passing on um, in terms of intellectual property or uh, assets or whatever it is that you want to pass on, especially like when it comes to your writing works and so forth. It's really, really important to have that conversation early, as early as possible. If you if you have a one-year-old and they can understand, have that conversation now and say, you know, one day mommy's an author and one day all this work is going to belong to you to look after for me. And it's simply having these conversations is, firstly, it's sensitizing those people that you want to be responsible for your legacy, that um, it's, some, it's an expectation you have of them. Because when we don't have conversations around expectations is when everybody has an assumption of what the expectation is. Is. And those assumptions are based on their own dreams and their own uh, way of living and their own thought processes. And as much as we think that we um, are loved by people and they understand us, thoughts, feelings are not transmutated. They are not passed on by just us hoping that the next person will understand what it is we want. It has to be communicated. We need to sit down and say, you know what, sweetheart, um, this is what I've been working on. This is what I've been building. And I would like you to be guardian of this because there is some financial return. And I have been using it in my own life, but when I'm no longer here, I would like it to help you in your own life, whether it's using it to take your kids on holiday, using it to make a deposit on a car and a house. I actually really don't mind how you use it, but I would like you to benefit from it because it's work that I've done and um, it's a financial return that I would like to see my grandkids also benefit from. And then you also have to consciously educate your ears whoever they are, your next gens, uh, family members, whoever who's going to take over this, that they are stewards. So being a steward means that you're a caretaker. You have the responsibility of understanding what it is that you are caretaking and being able to either take it to another level or maintaining it for somebody else who's going to step in into the seat of steward. And being an owner is also being a steward. So you don't necessarily have to join the family business. You don't necessarily have to write more books and add them to my catalog. You don't have to necessarily uh, do anything weird and wonderful, but there are ways that you can ensure that you get your dividend at the end of every period. And this is the period that we're looking at. So every month you have the possibility of gaining this much just simply by maintaining your ownership and making sure that everything is working. Even if it means hiring somebody else who can do this job at a full-time basis and who can grow whatever that I am, you are a steward of. So you might say, you know, I have my own career. I've got my own life. I don't have time to be uh, really paying attention to what's happening with your books, mom, and so forth. But you can hire somebody. You can find somebody who can be paid to grow this portfolio, who to grow the royalties, to add value to it, to create more content and context and approve it through yourself. And we look at great authors like um, J.R.R. Tolkien. Look at what Lord of the Rings became and his family benefit for, benefited from books that were written during, I think, the First or Second World War. And they are still benefiting from the royalties from all that because it became... The books were reprinted, they were changed into different languages, they were made into films, series, and all sort of things. So his estate is benefiting largely from the fact that there are stewards that were making sure to protect the estate and to protect um, the legacy of the author. So it's interesting what you said a little bit early on about supporting different skill sets within a family business. 
I know that I'm building this author business for my children to leave a legacy for them. However, my kids have come to me and said, look, we don't want to be authors, so we're not really interested in that. However, in order for them to get ongoing royalties, they have to be ongoing sales. So if there's no marketing, then there's going to be no royalties for them. How do you deal with those kinds of challenges where family members want to have a piece of the pie, but they don't necessarily want to be involved in the business? Absolutely. So a part of my work is I do governance workshops that help people understand what family governance is. And family governance is... Um, Put lightly, it's those conversations, those family meetings, that structuring of what is it that we own? Why do we own it? What are our values? Are they aligned? And what is the future of what we own? Um, would we like to maintain ownership of it? Would we like to at some point dispose of it? And who benefits from it? And who has the right to sell or not sell? Who has the right to be a custodian or a steward? Who has ownership? Who doesn't have ownership? And what does that look like? So um, through, through the workshops, I really go and give the hands-on approach to all the participants so that they understand what family governance is. It's not just for people in the traditional family business. It's for anybody, even those with just a family that have um, worked their lives and they've got pensions and they've got assets that they've built to really understand what it is to collaborate as family members, as different as we may be, as the world is getting smaller, it takes us to different spaces in the world. How can we continue to preserve um, hard work that's made by family members, investments that made up by family members, and how do we ensure that when we cannot manage them, we get the right people to come through and manage them for us. Um, and it's a decision then that is set up through governance structures where you set up um, a, a family council where core decision makers can decide who makes a decision when and why, and how do we communicate this decision and who then executes the decision. It's very important for families um, to understand that these are it, each family is different. When to have the conversation, how to have the conversation, why to have the conversation will differ from family to family. There's no one size fits all. The earlier you have the conversation, the better off it is because we don't have a set time frame that we can say, I, oh, oh, you know what, I am going to be alive until I'm 200 years old. Yes, we have um, goals where we say we would like to be alive to until this age. And most times, God bless them, it does work out that way. However, it's like insurance. Insurance is we take it just in case bad things happen. Not necessarily that we want bad things to happen, but just in case they do happen, we have a backup that's going to make sure that we were where we were when these bad things happened. And so ultimately, family governance is to ensure that it's our insurance plan as families. How can we communicate with each other? When do we communicate with each other? Who's responsible? And then how do we uh, how do we support them in their responsibilities? So you can start at any point in time, as long as you have a family and you have loved ones that you know will benefit from whatever it is that you're building. The best time to start is yesterday. The next best time to start is now. Thank you so much for that information. Now, if people wanted to get hold of you, how would they go about doing that? The best place to get hold of me is probably through my website, Naka Legacy, which is N-H-A-K-A -A Legacy as one word, dot com. I'm also on social media, mostly on LinkedIn. So you search for my name, Titi Mutendi on LinkedIn, and you reach out, drop me an inbox, or you send me um, an email at hello at nakalegacy.com. I'm always happy to support families. I'm always happy to answer questions and get you all on the pathway to preserve multi-generational wealth. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So if anyone wants to reach out to her, I am going to be popping the details down in the links below so you can get hold of her. And then just remember that you have to think past that first book. Think bigger because you really can build multiple streams of income for multiple generations from your books. Thank you and see you next time.